Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Marion Minor Cook Athenaeum. My name is Maria Gutierrez Vera, and I'm one of your three Athenaeum fellows this year. In the United States, the decades between the First World War and the Second brought us the Roaring Twenties, Fitzgerald's The Great Gatsby, Prohibition, and eventually a stock market crash. The Great Depression came along, as did FDR's New Deal, the Works Progress Administration, and a massive expansion of the federal government. For us, the story of World War II begins with Pearl Harbor, a deeply awful loss of life, and a declaration of war against Japan. However, the reality and timeline of events was much different for certain groups in Germany and the Soviet Union. Here tonight to talk about a, military, a German military and Soviet Union partnership that was designed to overturn order in Europe is Professor Ian Johnson. Ian Johnson is a historian of war, diplomacy, and technology. He received his PhD from The Ohio State University in 2016 with a dissertation that explored secret military cooperation between the Soviet Union and Germany in the interwar period, which will be the subject of tonight's talk. During graduate school, he was a recipient of the Fulbright Hayes Fellowship, as well as the OSU Presidential Fellowship. He is a graduate of Claremont McKenna College, where he majored in government and history, and of The Ohio State University, where his graduate coursework involved specializations in military history, Soviet history, and modern European history. He is currently the P.J. Moran Family Assistant Professor of, Milita of Military History at the University of Notre Dame and previously worked at Yale University, where he was a guest lecturer and the Associate Director of the Brady Johnson Program in Grand Strategy. Now, before we begin, we must ask that you all abide by the Athenaeum's health guidelines. Please keep your masks on, over your nose and mouth, for the duration of the talk indoors. If you would like to take a drink of water, we kindly ask that you step outside of the Edgar Dining Room to do so. Please take a moment now to silence and put away your cell phones. Ensure that your mask is properly fitted, and remember that, as always, video and audio recordings are strictly prohibited. Now, without further ado, please join me in welcoming Professor Ian Johnson to the Marion Minor Cook Athenaeum. Well, thank you, Maria, for that introduction here. Thank you, in addition to Director Priya Junar for inviting me to speak and to all of you for attending. Can you all, can you all hear me? Terrific. It's uh, really a pleasure, an honor, a treat to, to be back here at CMC uh, speaking on a stage that I saw a lot of really amazing and interesting people speak on during my, my four years here on campus. Um, one of you told me that you know you've made it as an alumni of CMC if you're, if you're speaking here at the Athenaeum. Uh, so it, uh, it's, it's, just, it's just wonderful to be able to share this project with all of you. Today I'm going to be speaking about my new book entitled Faustian Bargain, the Soviet-German Partnership and the Origins of the Second World War. My story is about how the Second World War happened just two brief decades after the first had ended, the war that was supposed to be the war to end all wars. The Second World War in Europe began on September 1st, 1939, when 50 divisions of the reborn German army invaded Poland from the west. Great Britain and France honored their pledge reluctantly to guarantee Poland's borders and declared war on Germany 48 hours later. And then to the shock and surprise of much of the world, two weeks later, the Soviet Union invaded Poland from the east as a German partner. The Second World War in Europe had begun. That the war began over Poland and that it happened with the Soviets and Germans working together was a product of the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact. On the 23rd of August, 1939, uh, Foreign Minister Molotov and, uh, and Ribbentrop had affixed their signatures to a treaty that included a secret annex partitioning Eastern Europe between the two dictators, Hitler and Stalin, and they also agreeing to exchange military equipment and key raw materials. The traditional story of that pact that initiated the Second World War in Europe is usually seen as one of opportunism. Two dictators who despised and hated each other saw temporary advantage in working together. But in fact, this was not the case. In fact, Germany and the Soviet Union had been working together in one way, shape, or form for nearly two decades by the time the, uh, the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact was signed. 
In fact, the invasion of Poland did not mark some about face or moment of our opportunism, but the culmination of a partnership that had begun amid the ashes of the end of the First World War. My book is the story of that pact and how it led the world back to war, a war that proved to be even more horrific in its conduct and consequences than the first. So my story ends with the, the outbreak of the Second World War, but it starts with the first. In the spring of 1919, the world finally seemed to be returning to peace. Germany had been defeated. The victorious allies gathered in Paris to decide what exactly Germany's punishment would be for having been the major combatant power against them. In April 1919, as those negotiations were ongoing, a young German officer found himself in the odd position of trying to prevent the First World War from resuming. 30-year-old Major Fritz Schuke was serving as a liaison officer with the new Lithuanian army. Lithuania had just reemerged as a country in the then capital city of Kovna. The Reichswehr, the interwar German army, had assigned him to assist dismantling Germany's brief-lived empire in Eastern Europe. And he essentially oversaw shipments of weapons and supplies back from Lithuania back to Germany. Sitting in his tiny orderly room on a Lithuanian Air Force base in April 1919, he saw a pale looking and disheveled man pass his line of sight in the hallway, being dragged by two armed guards to one of the handful of cells on the base. It was this man, Enver Pasha, the former Turkish Minister of War. Pasha was on the Allied Powers list of war criminals, almost at the very top, as he was the architect of the Armenian Genocide. And, uh, Shunka knew him personally as he'd served in Turkey during the war. He quickly realized that the Lithuanians had no idea who they had found, as it turned out, in a, a, a field next to a crashed aircraft. The Pasha, who was carrying forged identity papers, claimed that he was a Turkish Red Cross doctor volunteering to serve and help uh, people suffering from disease in Eastern Europe. Had the Lithuanians known who they actually had in their hands, they would have immediately turned him over to British and French forces based out of their embassies elsewhere in the city. Shunka was very much concerned, as you might imagine. He snuck into the jail cell at night sometime in the next few days, and he met with Pasha privately. He learned that the Pasha had been traveling from Berlin to Moscow on a secret mission, but his plane had developed mechanical difficulties and been forced to land make an emergency landing just outside the Lithuanian capital. Then to Shunka's great horror, the Pasha informed him that, quote, important maps and documents from the German general staff were hidden on the airplane, and I was not able to retrieve them, end quote. Shunka realized that if the Allied powers got a hold of a bunch of secret documents being transported from Germany to Bolshevik Russia, with whom all of the Allied powers were at war, this could mean the First World War re-erupting. Germany might be occupied, war could resume on the Western Front. The consequences could be catastrophic. That very night, Schunke found the aircraft, broke into it with the assistance of a German pilot in the employ of the Lithuanian Air Force, retrieved all the materials inside and destroyed them. But now he realized he had a problem. The Pasha was still in custody, and if he spilled uh, the secrets that he had, again, the, the problem remained. The First World War could, could begin anew. So taking advantage of his position as a liaison officer in Lithuania, he convinced some of the Lithuanian guards with whom he was on friendly terms to give the unrecognized prisoner the right to go on walks rather than being kept on his cell, at least a couple times a day. Shunka somehow managed to convince them to allow these walks to pass through a, a park just outside the Air Force Base that happened to border this, a civilian airstrip, the, the airport for the, the city of Kovno. Schunke ordered his German mercenary buddy in the employ of the Lithuanian Air Force to prepare an aircraft on a runway on a given date. At a designated time, uh, the, the pilot and some of his accomplices were to have an aircraft engine on taxiing on this runway. When the prescribed hour arrived, uh, Enver Pasha, who was not a particularly fit man, and his guards were walking within sight of the airstrip, and the, the Pasha, the former minister of war, took off at a dead run. The aircraft roared to life, the guards opened fire as he fled, was pulled into the aircraft by German hands, and the plane took off and wheeled in the direction of Germany. Schunke had no idea 
what he had just been involved with here. He, he had no sense of the bigger picture for some years. But he would eventually learn the mystery of why Enver Pasha had landed in a Lithuanian cell. It turned out that German General Hans von Zeigt, in charge of the German army in the aftermath of the First World War, had been meeting with Bolshevik revolutionary Karl Radek, who had been arrested for trying to incite revolution in Germany. But the two had become uh, acquaintances while Radek had been in prison. Together, the two men had encouraged Pasha to journey to Moscow as an unofficial emissary. They hoped to arrange a covert military pact between Germany and Soviet Russia. But traveling over a vast region riven by war, disease, and famine, it would take two more attempts, another near capture, and almost a year before Enver Pasha would finally reach Moscow and, as we'll see, play a role in the formation of the defining interwar partnership. Returning to Germany shortly after Enver Pasha's near miss in Lithuania, the idea of a Soviet-German partnership, the sort of thing that he was tasked with promoting, was almost unfathomable. It's very difficult to overstate how much the German military and their future German Soviet partners hated each other. In the same year they would begin negotiating, Lenin would call the German military in public speeches savages, plunderers, and predators, and note that in the First World War, the German robber barons would break all records in war atrocities. For the Bolsheviks, the German officers with whom they would, were dealing were the archetypes of counter-revolution, the, the most uh, villainous of, of the right. The German officer corps, for its part, was about as fond of its Bolshevik partners, as you get a sense from this propaganda image here. General Wilhelm Gruner, one of the most important military officers, would call Lenin and Trotsky enemies and just the devil in official correspondence. No love was lost there. More expressively, a German veteran and Reichswehr non-commissioned officer would write that, quote, the rulers of present-day Russia are common blood-stained criminals. They are the scum of humanity carrying on the most cruel and tyrannical regime of all time. This was more or less the common view. So why on earth did two groups, the German military and the Soviet state, groups that saw each other as the literal embodiment of evil, why did they, they cut a deal? Why did they reach what turned out to be an enormously significant pact with one another? Well, it turned out that their hostility to the international order, as established after the First World War, uh, was greater than their hostility to each other. In the summer of 1919, the victorious allies had finally decided what Germany's punishment would be for ostensibly having started the First World War. The Treaty of Versailles, which officially ended that war, uh, forcibly disarmed Germany, reduced its vaunted army from 500, or 5 million to less than 100,000 men. Germany was banned from possessing aircraft, armored vehicles, submarines, chemical weapons, all of the modern accoutrements of war. Germany also lost 10% of its territory, 7 million residents. And in addition, Germany would have inspectors stationed all over its territory, destroying factories, blowing up munitions stockpiles, and trying to make sure that Germany could never again initiate a world war. The terms were viewed as so harsh by the German high command when they learned of them that they held a secret conference to discuss the, the, the possibility of essentially reopening the war, seeing if they could fight on. But they rapidly concluded resistance was impossible, particularly as long as the US Army remained in Europe. Instead, they would almost immediately embark upon a program to undo the results of the First World War, to restore Germany's military might surreptitiously, and in, for several years at least, concealed, in fact, even from their own government. The great aim was to win a war of revenge against France and Poland, and thereby overturn the treaty that had stripped Germany of territory and dismantled its vaunted military. Meanwhile, in 1919, the Soviet Union was not yet in existence. The Bolshevik Revolution was in the midst of a desperate fight for its very survival against the forces of 18 different allied states, as well as the various white counter-revolutionary forces uh, domestic to the, the former Tsarist Empire. Not until the fall of 1919 would it even become clear the Bolsheviks would survive and, and be able to establish a state. Once they did emerge victorious, the country suffered from a massive famine, was devastated by cholera and typhus, and the economy was in complete ruins. It was at that moment of isolation that the two sides began very surreptitiously and quietly talking. 
There was a war between Poland and, and the Bolsheviks ongoing in 1920, and the two sides began exchanging military envoys, including Enver Pasha, who finally reached Moscow in August 1920. They exchanged intelligence about the capacities and capabilities of the Polish army, and also technology. The Germans would sell some military equipment through neutral Sweden to assist the Bolsheviks. The fact that there was a war between Poland and, and Soviet Russia at this juncture further highlighted how much the two sides had in common. Future Foreign Minister Molotov would call Poland the monstrous bastard of Versailles in Politburo meetings. And General Zeik, for his part, pledged to the, the army in private correspondence to, quote, wipe Poland off the map. The first secret conference was held not long after, in the summer of 1921. In April 1922, Soviet Russia and Weimar Germany signed the Treaty of Rapallo that normalized diplomatic relations between the two states. Five months later, People's Commissar for Military and Naval Affairs Leon Trotsky and German General Hans von Seidt, pictured here, would formalize an arrangement to initiate military cooperation. What did they hope to gain from each other? Well, German General Hans von Seidt, commanding the Reichswehr from 1920 to 1926, wanted to rebuild the German military away from the prying eyes of inspectors and allied soldiers then stationed in Germany. He had three means to this end. The first was to relocate banned industrial production in areas that produce things like tanks, planes, and chemical weapons to the USSR. There, German engineers could be kept in employment, retain their skills, and build up stockpiles of weapons for use in the next war. Next, he foresaw that German officers, quite few in number, only 4,000 were allowed under the terms of Versailles, should be trained on the very most advanced technologies available. This would become, allow them to become superior to their Western adversaries through a mastery of technological know-how. The problem was that they had no access to tanks or planes, submarines or chemical weapons in Germany because of the Allies. The Soviet Union was the only place they could safely study the new means of war. And until some arrangement could be reached, this is how German officers practice tank warfare. They're holding some paper mache, they've got a car uh, to simulate planes, they'd have to use motorcycles with cardboard wings attached. This was something of a, a the German officers viewed this as somewhat de degrading in the aftermath of the First World War to have to practice new methods of warfare in this manner. Now finally, Zeik also sought to develop new technologies of war themselves. Tanks, planes, submarines couldn't be developed in Germany. Only by relocating engineers and industrial plant to the USSR could the Reichswehr begin the process of technological rearmament in preparation for a new war. Now, Leon Trotsky, the, the head of the, the Red Army in this period, he had different ambitions, but ones that aligned in many ways with, with Zeke's ambitions. He sought to rebuild a devastated Soviet Union as it would be renamed with, Soviet, with German assistance. He re saw the relocation of German industry to the Soviet Union as an unalloyed good. This would allow the Soviet Union to develop its own industries and produce very high quality new tanks, planes, and other military equipment. He also hoped to have German officers train and prepare the next generation of professional Soviet officers, engineers, and scientists. The Red Army was in pretty disastrous state in the aftermath of the Russian Civil War, although they had in fact won. The vast majority of its men had no uniforms, let alone weapons. A majority of the officer corps were untrustworthy in Soviet eyes, czarist era officers, many drawn from the aristocracy. They had to be monitored closely by political commissars, lest they betray the country. The Air Force at this juncture was down to about four dozen aircraft, uh, most of which were not really safe to fly. And the entire Soviet tank force in the aftermath of the war, which only had about 19 tanks, was redeployed to plow tra uh, fields in Ukraine in 1922. This was not much of a modern military force. Trotsky wanted help from Germany in developing a new professional officer corps and new technologies of war to safeguard the communist revolution. As a result, between 1922 and 1933, the Soviets and Germans would build a network of secret facilities and military bases throughout the Soviet Union to accomplish these goals. The first element of their partnership, and one that would continue fitfully all the way until 1941, the date when Hitler would attack the Soviet Union and end their partnership, centered on German corporations developing Soviet military industry. 
Again, uh, providing opportunities for employment for German engineers, scientists, and technicians, and preserving a core of technical know-how for that next war Zeke believed was coming. The Germans would relocate entire factories to the USSR, particularly chemical weapons and aircraft, in industries they had great difficulty concealing from Allied inspection teams. Here you can see a picture of the Feely Aviation Plant just outside of Moscow. The German military would essentially take over management of this uh, factory through shell corporations in 1923, where it would begin to produce single-seater fighters and eventually the first Soviet four-engine bomber. Several thousand Russian workers were employed here, operating under German managers and German and Russian engineering teams. Other German-managed or run facilities across the USSR would produce artillery, tanks, chemical weapons, rifles, machine guns, submarines, just about anything with military utility. The Germans invested and, and became involved. The scale of this economic cooperation reached just about staggering proportions. Almost every major German corporation would receive contracts from the Red Army to build weapons or factories, 255 German companies in total. Much of this was mediated by the German army that set up a secret shell corporation in Moscow, they became quite adept at doing this, to essentially serve as a negotiating center for German firms looking to relocate banned production to the USSR. To give you some sense of how significant German investment and development was, by the time the Second World War began, 50% of all Soviet tank production was de dependent on German built, managed, or organized factories. Now as corporate projects took off all across the USSR, the German military wanted to pursue its, its goal of training officers and testing new technologies. The first of the arrangements dedicated to that end centered on salvaging Germany's air power. In 1923, Zeke began dispatching German pilots to a Soviet air base near Lipetsk in south central Russia. Their task was to train Soviet would-be pilots, uh, essentially a basic flight technique. In exchange for training Soviet pilots and mechanics and others, uh, eventually the Germans acquired the entire base on a lease from the Soviet government. The Soviets would allow them to do anything they wanted, train pilots, test new technologies, in exchange for allowing the Soviets access to whatever arrived here. Now the students who studied at Lipetsk were supposed to be the best. They were also supposed to be very young. The German military, again dedicated to a war of revenge, believed that that war was somewhere around 10 to 15 years away in 1923. They thought sometime in the late 1930s the new war would begin, quite presciently. As a result, they concluded that pilots should be between the ages of 18 and 25, which meant they would be in their prime when this new war came. In fact, there's, uh, in, in the German archives, there's some funny correspondence. A lot of these pilots were so young that letters were sent by the German military to their parents, telling them essentially to, uh, how, how to help their, their sons pack for this secret facility. Now, a lot of these individuals, of course, were trying to go surreptitiously to this base, but they, they weren't necessarily very good at it. Many had served in the German army in the First World War, and they had a tendency to not disguise their military bearing very well. So in this photo from the German archives, these young men are lined up by height, like you do on a parade ground, and most of them are wearing military uh, shoes here. And they weren't, they weren't necessarily very good at the, the uh, espionage or, or secrecy game. Nonetheless, many of them were very, would become very skilled flyers. Selected cadets would begin their training with six months of basic flight training managed at a commercial flight school under Lufthansa, which was essentially organized to help surreptitiously rebuild German air power. And then the best graduates of this program, those who were deemed to be potential fighter pilots, would, be, would depart to Lipetsk in the spring, disguised as tourists. Not a lot of tourists were headed to the USSR in, say, 1926, but nonetheless, that was their cover. Upon arrival, they were put through a very strict training schedule. Monday through Saturday, they woke up at 5 or 6 a.m. for two hours of flight time, where they'd be trained by World War I-era aces. The young pilots then had an hour of class on aircraft maintenance, an hour of technical instruction, followed by a brief lunch break. After their meal, they had rotating lectures covering topics including tactics, organization, and metal aircraft, followed by a very Russian tea break. Their long day concluded with shooting and tactical lessons and then Russian language training, 
And I should note that as part of the arrangement, the Russians were allowed to give a few kind of propagandistic lectures that most of the cadets would sleep through on things like the five-year plan and Soviet agricultural production. And this was not necessarily a, a joyride. It could be very dangerous to learn how to fly in this period. Um, Dozens of would-be trainees were hurt or killed learning their craft. And in fact, so many corpses would be shipped back to Germany that an entire process had to be organized for shipping them back in crates marked uh, machine tools. But the pilots also had some fun in their off hours. Many had local girlfriends, though the Soviet secret police occasionally rounded up women caught fraternizing with the Germans. The young men played games. They threw parties with their Soviet counterparts, like the New Year's picture uh, image you can see pictured here. Re what is remarkable, though, is at the same time that this was taking place, a few years after this photo, but you know, when, when these sorts of parties and games were being thrown, just outside the gates of the base, thousands of Soviet civilians were starving to death, victims of Soviet collectivization. In fact, famine victims would frequently be caught trying to climb over the barbed wire fences of the camp to get at the camp's food supplies. The Germans got a lot out of these bases. They trained new pilots, discovered new techni techniques and tactics, and also tested new technologies uh, in the air. Nearly a 1,000 pilots, mechanics, and observers would go through the school at Lipetsk. For context, this was about the entire size of the German Air Force when Hitler officially reformed it in 1935. 22 Officers who had reached the three-star rank or above it, the top ranks of the Luftwaffe, had either studied, taught, or commanded this facility at Lipetsk. One, one of its alumni, Luftwaffe General Wilhelm Speidel, would later write, reflecting on his time at the base, that, quote, the entire spiritual foundations of the Luftwaffe had been developed on that aeronautical field. So what were the Soviets getting out of all of this? They, too, trained pilots and mechanics and engineers alongside the Germans, in huge numbers, in fact. But their main goal was to access German technology. Germany made some of the best planes in the world. German engineering technology was considered to be second to none. In addition, because Germany had nowhere to test new combat aircraft, every single aviation manufacturer in Germany, all of which had illegal aircraft design bureaus working on combat aircraft in violation of both German and international law, were sending their prototypes to this secret base. The Soviets were supposed to be allowed to inspect these aircraft, but consistently believed the Germans weren't showing them everything during the day. As a result, the Germans would wake up almost every morning to find parts or blueprints moved around the various offices, the Soviets having broken into the offices nightly to steal technology or photograph various blueprints. Now, Lipetsk was only part of a much larger network, naturally, of course, being a little impressionistic. But I want to give you a sense of a few of the other key facilities operating here. A few hundred miles away and near the city of Kazan, the Germans and Soviets had another joint base operating called Kama, dedicated to tank warfare. Most of the most prominent theorists of armored warfare in both the USSR and Germany would train or learn how to drive and, and operate tanks at this facility. 17 divisional commanders on the German side would pass through the facility. For context, the German army had 18 armored divisions in 1941, almost all commanded by alumni of this facility. And nearly every tank the Germans would use in the opening phases of the war would be developed at this facility, tested and based on prototype work conducted there, much like in aviation. Now, the most secretive element of this network, besides the corporate facilities, these various training facilities, centered on chemical weapons production. Two facilities, joint facilities operating under both Soviet and German officers, co-commandants, existed in the Soviet Union in this period. You can see here a picture of the, the German scientists working at Tomka, the larger of the two facilities. Most of these individuals were academics. They were scientists who worked for the German chemical weapons program in the First World War. Some of them had been labeled war criminals and gone underground after the war. Others uh, found employment at universities. When the German army asked many of them to relocate, to begin testing new chemical agents, new dispersion techniques, many uh, very readily volunteered. You can also see, rather darkly, uh, there's a group of younger men in the background. These are graduate students. They were all working on their PhDs in German universities, and their advisors had gone to this various facility to work on chemical warfare. 
for these poor graduate students on both the German and Soviet sides, they were the guinea pigs for chemical weapons experimentation. They'd, uh, they'd have mustard gas tested on their hand and then an agent sprayed to see if it would stop the skin from blistering and peeling off. They would be forced to put on uh, new equipment to see if uh, someone could survive being uh, gassed with a new agent. Uh, you know, fingers crossed, so they did so. My advisor did point out that this meant I had grad school very easy compared to most of the, uh, the individuals in my story here. Um, perhaps the most important element uh, of this secret testing program centered on a really horrific concept. And that was the idea that chemical weapons could be used in conjunction with strategic bombing. What if German and Soviet technicians asked, what if you could carpet bomb London with mustard gas or phosgene or chlorine, killed all of the inhabitants of the city, but leave the city itself intact, ready for capture, ready to begin industrial production as soon as it was occupied? They tried to test this theory at these secret facilities. These cages, they would put dogs in them, They'd essentially build a model city, and then they'd spray from the air, from aircraft, new chemical agents and test new dispersal techniques. Thankfully for world history, they, both sides concluded this was not really functional. Chemical agents tended to disperse unless you flew at very low altitudes. And if you flew at very low altitudes, you were likely to be shot down. As a result, unlike the First World War where chemical weapons were used extensively, both the Germans and the Soviets would eschew a first use chemical weapons policy in the Second World War, saving Europe perhaps from even more catastrophic destruction than was, would in fact be visited upon it. Between 1922 and 1933, this Soviet-German network I've described grew to huge proportions, involving thousands, tens of thousands of officers and men if the entire Soviet side is, is included. But in January 1933, Adolf Hitler, leading the largest party in the Reichstag, the, the Nazi party, was appointed chancellor by President Hindenburg. Cooperation actually played some role in Hitler's rise to power, something I'd be happy to discuss in the Q&A if you're interested. In any case, despite his own personal hatred of communism, Hitler did not immediately end cooperation. It would linger for about two years. Most of the joint facilities would wrap up by the end of 1933, but some technical collaboration would continue until 1935. Hitler, as soon as Hitler felt strong enough to begin restarting technical development in Germany, and the Allies had withdrawn most of their inspectors by this juncture, he essentially began relocating those facilities uh, to, to Germany itself. So cooperation ended, at least for a time, in 1935. Before I turn to the final consequences of this pact, I want to talk about some of the larger historical takeaways. What happened after cooperation ended? How it reshaped the international order before 1939? As I've tried to lay out here, Germany was almost completely dependent on its secret facilities in the USSR for its own rearmament. It couldn't do any of the sort of stuff, build planes, test tanks, work on chemical weapons in Germany itself. When Hitler came to power, he almost immediately and aggressively began expanding covert military expenditures. Thanks to cooperation with the USSR, the German military had a, a great foundation for Hitler's arms race, the race that he would start almost as soon as he took power. Germany was technologically and doctrinally essentially on par with Great Britain and France, despite not having had access to military facilities on their own soil. German military expenditures would grow from 0.3% of GDP in 1932 to 5.5% by the end of 1935, moving to an almost on-war footing. By the end of that year, the new Luftwaffe had received over 5,500 aircraft from German industry. More than 500 new tanks had been issued to the Wehrmacht, the German army. In October 1935, a new generation of armored vehicles based on prototype testing and development at Kama were just entering mass production. In other words, a window to halt German rearmament was rapidly closing already. The consequences would be felt immediately in European diplomacy. When Hitler marched into the previously demilitarized Rhineland in 1936, in violation of the Treaty of Versailles, in violation of German dynastic law, the chief of the French general staff informed the cabinet of then French prime minister to his shock that the French military could only respond to Hitler's brazen act of aggression 
with proper investment and mobilization in 12 months. As the chief of staff concluded, the German army was already the strongest in Europe. The German Air Force was significantly stronger than the, the French Air Force as well. If the French army tried to intervene and stop Hitler from remilitarizing the Rhineland, they'd start a general war, which would eventually be won by Germany, thanks to its larger population and military industry. Therefore, he argued, no military action sh could or should be taken. Appeasement, in other words. The assessment of the British government was much the same. You get a sense here from a cartoon in 1936, perhaps earlier than we think about appeasement taking place. The original caption was, how much will you give me not to kick your pants for, say, 25 years? And it's Hitler menacing a group of foreign statesmen. The British uh, intelligence services had already concluded that German rearmament had, uh, had reached essentially very dangerous levels by 1935, which led that government to include or to sign one of the most uh, damaging acts of appeasement, the 1935 Naval Agreement, often forgotten, and then the even more infamous Munich Agreement in 1938. In other words, the perception that Hitler was ahead in an arms race was steering British and French decision making. They concluded that he either had to be bought off or delayed until British and French rearmament caught up. And it's important to note here, you couldn't simply uh, buy a new, new military apparatus overnight. It took four to six years to develop a new tank or aircraft design from scratch. The, German, the French and British had not been doing this for much of the interwar period, while well, the Germans had in the Soviet Union. The foundation laid by co earlier cooperation essentially paid immediate dividends for, for Hitler once he came to power, deterring intervention as he achieved one foreign policy goal after another between 1933 and 1938. Now, while Hitler profited from cooperation, things took a very different turn in the USSR. Relations plunged to their nadir as Hitler became increasingly aggressive in his rhetoric about communism. On June 2, 1937, at a meeting of the Soviet Re Revolutionary Military Council that oversaw the Soviet military, Stalin made a surprise appearance. He announced to a shocked audience that the deputy commissar of defense, Mikhail Tukhachevsky, generally considered the, the, the genius of the Red Army, the smartest man in uniform, had just been arrested for committing treason. Stalin delivered a speech in which he warned, comrades, I hope after I present this evidence that no one will now doubt that a secret military political plot against Soviet power existed in the Red Army. After a meandering and frankly quite contradictory speech, he eventually accused Tukhachevsky of passing along German or Soviet operational plans, what he called the Holy of Holies to the German Army. Tukhachevsky and nine fellow officers were accused of being part of an anti-Soviet spy ring working with the German army. In the 10 days after Tukhachevsky's arrest, nearly 1,000 senior commanders in the Red Army would be arrested, and many tortured and shot. The purge would expand over the next 18 months, eventually claiming 11% of the Soviet officer corps, with very disproportionately uh, effects in the highest ranks. 90% of officers holding the rank of general or above would be arrested and shot between 1937 and 1938. The arrest would also decimate diplomatic services, intelligence, logistics, research, and others. In total, amazingly, Stalin would shoot between three and four times as many of his own senior officers in 1937 and 38 as would die in the entire Second World War. The logic of the Great Terror as this maelstrom of repression and violence became known, remains very hotly debated by historians. Some scholars variously argue that Stalin sought to consolidate his control over the military, that he was concerned about the political reliability of aristocratic officers, Tukhachevsky was one of them, or that he may actually have believed a coup was imminent. But the German role in educating so many Soviet officers between 1922 and 1933 really has not been explored prior to this, this book. That's surprising, as it's actually the official reason Tukhachevsky was shot. At his show trial, prosecutors claimed that Tukhachevsky had been acting under the direct supervision of the German general staff since they began sending officers to the USSR. In the event of war, Tukhachevsky was going to open the front to the Germans with the expectation that the Germans would help Tukhachevsky launch a military coup in Moscow to seize power and function as a sort of Napoleon governing the Soviet Union. Prosecutors brought up Tukhachevsky's past work with the Reichswehr, his time at the various secret facilities, as evidence 
Now, the great preponderance of historical evidence suggests the whole plot was made up, that Stalin knew it was a fiction, but some elites running the Soviet state may have actually believed parts of the Red Army would collaborate with the Germans in the event of war. Whatever the case, Stalin was clearly concerned that the Red Army might not be reliable in the event of a war with Germany. Now remember, Trotsky's whole project had been to train a new generation of officers who could replace politically suspect older ones with German assistance. As a result, officers who had studied either in Germany or been trained by German officers who were embedded in almost every major institution of education in the Red Army, essentially the, the Germans had trained most of the senior ranks of the Red Army. Paranoid as he already was, Stalin must have noted how many of his commanders had lived, studied, or trained in Germany, his most likely military adversary. And rather disturbingly, you can see this in the documentary records. I uh, pulled files from the Politburo requesting lists of every senior officer who had lived in Germany or was connected to the German army, just as the purges were beginning. That list included two of the Soviet Union's five marshals, the most senior rank, the commander of the Soviet Air Forces, the head of all Soviet military education, as well as most of the country's corps and divisional commanders, the senior ranks of the Red Army. Almost none would survive until 1941. The obliteration of those who had worked alongside the Germans went very deep in the Red Army. One surviving Red Army officer said that everyone he had knew from his time training at Kama had been purged by 1938, including plumbers who had made visits to the base, the janitorial staff, and even waitresses at the camp mess hall. The accusations made at the show trials, the internal justification for the purges, and the selection of victims all suggest that cooperation drove Stalin's paranoia. The consequences for this purge are difficult to overstate. The British and French had been negotiating with Moscow to build an anti-Nazi coalition since 1935, reluctantly given some of their concerns about communism, but nonetheless, they had, they had signed a number of agreements. They recoiled in horror as news of the mass bloodletting in the USSR leaked out. New British Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain commented that the purges had made Soviet Russia, quote, a very unreliable friend with little capacity for assistance, but with an enormous irritative effect on others. The French general staff, for their part, concluded that the Soviet Union in the event of war would be incapable of defending its own borders, let alone assisting the British or French in a war against Hitler. This led British and French policymakers to exclude the Soviet Union from the Munich Conference, among other things. No Soviet representatives were present, even though the Soviet Union had a mutual assistance pact with Czechoslovakia, the state under examination at the Munich Conference. And perhaps not surprisingly, as a result, immediately following their exclusion from Munich, Soviet-German relations would begin to warm. By January 1939, just three months after the Munich Conference had dismembered Czechoslovakia, the Soviets were quietly prepared to open negotiations with the Germans on a broad economic and political settlement of all issues in Eastern Europe. Those talks initially did not go anywhere, as Hitler was still reluctant to deal with the communist government in Moscow. But in April 1939, Hitler suddenly decided a new partnership with the Soviets was in his interest, for a variety of reasons that I discuss in the book. And interestingly, when he decided that was the case, he had the foreign ministry pass along word to Stalin that he desired to, quote, renew the old Rapallo relationship. In other words, the previous period of cooperation, it was time to resume it. It had only been suspended for four years at this point in any case. As I said at the beginning of my talk, in August 1939, Germany and the Soviet Union would agree to the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact. Uh, you can see a, a happy Stalin here, N never, a, never a good sign. This treaty partitioned Eastern Europe between the two dictators, Hitler and Stalin, with Stalin receiving the lion's share of territory. In exchange, the Soviet Union would be expected to supply Germany with oil and other critical raw materials and assist in Germany's war at sea against Great Britain, as well as invading Poland as a German ally. Military cooperation would also soon resume along some of the same lines as, as previously. The Germans would actually set up a new naval base on Soviet soil near Murmansk, they would sell huge quantities of weapons to the Soviets, as they had in previous periods, and send engineers to assist Soviet shipbuilders in Leningrad. It was a close partnership, one much uh, pilloried by the international press here. We see Stalin as the, the bridegroom 
But most importantly for the, the story of the Second World War, it paved the way immediately for Hitler's invasion of Poland, removing the, front of a two, the prospect of a two-front war in the event of rapid Polish defeat. Hitler would go ahead with his invasion of Poland on September 1st, 1939, with the Soviets invading from the east some 16 days later. Soviet and German forces would meet in central Poland on September 18th as the remaining Polish forces would fight their way into neutral Romania. On September 22nd, 1939, German General Heinz Guderian, perhaps the most famous tank, uh, tank commander in the German military, met with a Soviet counterpart, Semyon Krivoshein, pictured here. Here's Guderian and here's Krivoshein. The two men may have known each other, we don't know for sure, but they had both learned how to drive tanks and operate tanks at Kama at various times. Speaking in French, a language that they both knew, the two officers agreed to hold a joint victory parade to commemorate the defeat of Poland and oversee the turning, the, uh, turning over of the city of Brest-Litovsk from German to Soviet uh, control. It was in the Soviet zone, but the Germans, in fact, had conquered the town. Guderian's forces were to pull out of the town that afternoon as it was being turned over to the Soviets. Around 4 p.m., that cool autumn afternoon, the two men gathered on a hastily erected uh, wooden reviewing stand to watch joint procession through town. The two men, both tank officers, chatted pleasantly as their soldiers passed in front of them. Although technically both armies banned their men from fraternizing with each other, they exchanged cigarettes, climbed on each other's vehicles, and compared uniforms. This was the high point of the Soviet-German partnership. Only 22 months later, the two states would be at war with each other. On June 22, 1941, Hitler launched Operation Barbarossa, his invasion of the, the Soviet Union. It's the largest invasion in world history to that date. More than 30 million people would die on the Eastern Front over the next four years. What is remarkable about the two enemy armies fighting on the Eastern Front was how much they had in common. Rarely in the annals of history have two opponents spent so much time preparing each other for war. Invading German forces marched on rubber boots. Rubber had been imported from the USSR. Their German rations included Soviet grain, which had continued to arrive until the day of the invasion. Their ammunition contained chrome, nickel, steel, and manganese, all mined in the Soviet Union. German vehicles and aircraft drew heavily from the legacy of engineering work conducted on Soviet soil. They were fueled by oil that had been pumped not long before in the Caucasus. Many senior German commanders had trained in the USSR, and in fact, many of them spoke quite good Russian. At least one uh, became quite well known for translating Russian poetry, medieval Russian poetry, in his spare time. And when these officers issued orders, they drew at least in part from lessons that they had learned alongside the Red Army in joint maneuvers and training for over 10 years. Across the lines, the story was much the same. Although few living senior Soviet officers had trained alongside the Germans, many junior ones had, and many had been trained in facilities that had been reorganized or managed by German officers. In many instances, they had been taught by the German officers attacking them. Among the Red Army's most famous professors during cooperation were names like Erich von Manstein, Walter Mödel, Friedrich von Paulus, famous for his defeat and capture at Stalingrad, and Field Marshal Wilhelm Keitel, who was actually overseeing the invasion force of the Soviet Union. Soviet operations, for their part, were managed by a Soviet general staff that essentially was plagiarized from the German model and headed by Marshal Semyon Timoshenko, who had lived in Germany in 1931. The tanks, aircraft, and artillery the Red Army would use to resist the Germans drew heavily from German designs. In one very embarrassing instance before the war began, a German designer actually sued the Soviet government for having stolen his technology in international court and had to be bought off by the German government to make the accusations go away. Many of the Soviet vehicles were powered by German-designed engines, particularly the, the much beloved by the Soviets BMW engines. The vehicles and aircraft themselves had been built in factories constructed with German help, equipped with German machine tools, and powered by coal that had been mined in Germany. As news of the German attack began to filter back from the West, Stalin reacted with disbelief. Surely, he asked the Politburo, Hitler would not attack like some brigand. He told Foreign Minister Molotov to go find the German ambassador. Surely this was some sort of misunderstanding. 
Molotov duly summoned German Ambassador Schulenberg to his office. Schulenberg, quivering and supposedly with tears in his eyes, began reading a memorandum accusing the Soviet Union of breaking the Soviet-German pact. Schulenberg concluded his remarks in a pregnant silence hung in the air of Molotov's office. Molotov asked, is this supposed to be a declaration of war? Schulenberg merely shrugged. He had instructions not to say anything. Molotov replied heatedly that it could be nothing else. As German troops, quote, have already crossed the Soviet border and cities like Odessa, Kiev, and Minsk have been bombed by German aircraft for over an hour and a half. Schulenberg again said nothing. At the end of the interview, all Molotov could stutter was, quote, what have we done to deserve this? I'll conclude there and, and look forward to your questions. Thank you so much, Professor Johnson, for such an informative talk. Um, if you have any questions that you would like to ask, um, we ask that you come up to one of the two microphones in the room. Please make sure you keep social distancing and um, just ask away. I'm uh, Gage Horn, I'm a senior at CMC. I was just wondering, is there any historical record showing there was the possibility of a Soviet betrayal had the war gone on, or was it really like Stalin was caught just completely off guard? Yeah, there's a lot of debate over this question. Um, I'm actually gonna be debating a historian named Sean McMeekin uh, at the National World War II Museum in about three weeks on, on this very question. So the argument has been presented that Stalin was actually going to betray Hitler first and that Hitler launched a preemptive attack. I've seen nothing in the archival evidence to suggest this was the case. I think the case is mostly based on forged documents produced by uh, some individuals who had their own axes to grind and wanted this to be the case. The Soviet military in the aftermath of the purges was an absolute mess. The suicide rate went up about 20% or 20, 20 times rather. Uh, alcoholism was rife. About half of all Soviet officers had no military training of any kind in 1941. I just don't think the Soviet military was capable of attacking. The evidence seemed to suggest that Stalin, who had read Mein Kampf very closely, thought that Hitler was not crazy enough to start a two-front war with Great Britain still undefeated, and that he had time, that war might not come until 1942 or 43. I think that suggests uh, that's the reason for complete Soviet strategic surprise uh, when, when, in fact, Hitler did attack. Thank you so much. Hi, uh, thank you so much for your talk. My question is actually not really founded in the interwar phase, it's more currently. So if that's fine with you. Sure, yeah. And um, it's actually a question about the UN Security Council that's compromised of China, Russia, UK, US, France, and non-permanent members as well. How do you see its current form? Is it effective? Do you think there's a current way that we should reform it? because they're so big, the powers, and China rising currently, Russia having a bigger influence in Eastern European countries. How do you see them working together, and do you think it's still an effective council? Sure, yeah, so a little background. I'm, uh, we discussed this earlier. I'm working on a new book that looks at attempts to arm the United Nations. The original plan for the UN was that it would have its own Army, Navy, Air Force, and nuclear arsenal. Um, that obviously did not happen uh, for a variety of reasons, and it actually led to the formation of NATO in part as a result. So uh, stay tuned for, for that book, which should be coming out in uh, two-ish years, <laughs> if things go well. Um, so the UN Security Council was intended as a, as a compromise measure. Essentially, what Roosevelt wanted to do, and Roosevelt was very much the architect of the original UN Charter in a variety of ways, was preserve the Grand Alliance that had just won the Second World War. He concluded essentially that four countries had the majority of the world's military might, that if they were all on board and collaborated and cooperated and got special privileges and rights in the new UN body, they collectively could police the world and prevent a new war from beginning. He hoped that each of them would assign men from their own militaries to serve in permanent international military positions uh, at the United Nations. And in fact, there is a UN military staff in New York whose job was to manage this massive UN army that was going to come into being and never did. Uh, now, I, apparently, they mostly just hang out in New York. It's considered kind of a vacation for colonels from Russia and the United States, mostly. Um, so obviously, the Security Council, that was, it was intended to be this effort to preserve the Grand Alliance. 
The reality was, though, that at its core, it was the idea of the veto, that any one of the great powers could veto the actions of the Security Council as a whole. The Soviets, who became uh, quite hostile to the UN project fairly early on, essentially used this veto to prevent the UN from intervening in any of the early conflicts of the Cold War, except the Korean War, when they happened to be absent and the UN would deploy its one and only actual army, rather than peacekeepers, to a military conflict. But that was really the exception that proved the rule. The UN could not function uh, as the key element of, of security architecture for the US or the other great powers. So what we're, we're left with is, is sort of the, the accidental vestiges of what had been intended by Roosevelt, uh, Churchill, and Stalin in 1945. And just to go back, because they can veto anything, do you think it should be a reform to countries, other countries join? Um, do you think it's so effective? Like if any country can veto each other and they're pretty much polar opposites? Yeah, so the League of Nations, the UN predecessor organization, had the same problem. Uh, their executive council did not have the US on it. It, had, it did have Italy and Japan on it though. And they also could exercise functionally a veto. When there were efforts to reform the body, to get rid of the veto, to make it more effective at you know, critiquing dictators, enforcing what was you know, not human rights, but what we would now call human rights, these sorts of things, Naturally, Italy and Japan increasingly vetoed every measure, so reform became impossible. I suspect the UN is in the same position today because it, it exists with this veto power embedded in it. Uh, there, there's no way to reform it uh, from within. Thank you. Hello. Thank you for your, uh, for your speech. I had a quick question. Was there a reason behind um, the bases that were like, built, in, um, built for the Germans in the Soviet Union? What, was there a reason why they were so deep within the country as Germany was quite distant, as there were the kind of Eastern Bloc extended pretty close to Poland at that time? Yeah, absolutely. So um, one of the main concerns was secrecy on both sides. The Soviets were somewhat embarrassed that they were working with uh, the Germans, <laughs> the German military in particular. And the Germans were very afraid uh, that the, the Allies would essentially occupy Germany. Again, Germany had very little military forces to speak of. Uh, through 1927 or 28, the Allies had enough troops in Germany to essentially take over the whole country in the event they caught the Germans. So the Germans were constantly trying to experiment with efforts at secrecy. They would uh, weld tractor plows on the front of these tank prototypes as they shipped them. You know, if someone had lifted up the tarp, they would have seen a, there's a cannon on the top. So, you know, how effective was that? But they were constantly trying to innovate ways to, to hide what was ongoing from uh, the British and French inspectors in particular. This was one reason they were dispersed and not located in major cities. There was only one facility in the immediate environs of Moscow. Most of the rest were out in provincial centers. Um, there was also a desire for some distance from major cities because initially the first chemical weapons facility was built in the Moscow suburbs. And as I noted, they're testing chemical weapons from the air. This base was only seven miles from the Kremlin. And the first couple times they started dropping, say, mustard gas from planes, they were killing people in the Moscow suburbs. Uh, and so eventually the Germans said, maybe we should relocate the base. And the Soviets said, you know, it doesn't really matter, but if you want to move it, we're happy to do so. So that they would, in fact, move the chemical weapons facility out in the middle of absolutely nowhere in 1927. Um, thank you for your time. Um, so I was wondering, you talked at the beginning about um, this war of revenge that the Germans may have been preparing for. Um, would we have had this Soviet-German partnership had Versailles gone a little bit differently? What if, I don't know, the United States delegation uh, kind of got their way a little more and reparations and uh, post-war policy looked different? Would you have um, expected or anticipated something similar coming out? Yeah, it's a really interesting question. What role did Versailles, this treaty that's often seen as much too harsh, play in this desire for revenge? Well, what's interesting, I think, so I, I started with this story of this plane crash and kind of escape in Lithuania. That whole incident took place before any terms had been decided at Versailles. The problem for the German military was not what would end up being the terms of Versailles, though of course they disliked them. It was the fact they'd lost. And in fact, as even before Versailles was known, they were already contemplating how they would fight that next war. So in my mind, the problem was not necessarily that Versailles, Versailles was too harsh. It was that the Allies did not enforce it effectively. They allowed all of these violations to take place and allowed Germany to effectively rearm. Either the terms could have been much less harsh and the Allies maintained vigilance, or they could have been much more harsh and enforced properly. Instead, uh, the British and French essentially 
threaded a middle course that accomplished none of their strategic aims. Thank you so much. Hi, Professor. I have a question, actually. Um, so earlier today when we spoke, you mentioned you spent a lot of time in various archives, um, kind of in preparation for your book and also doing research. So my question is, um, did you find anything like particularly interesting that you wish you'd included in the book? Or did you find anything that like kind of like has served as an academic inspiration for another project? Yeah, absolutely. You know, as, as a historian, you're always looking for that story. Um, I, I found the project I'm working on right now in part as a, a, a product of this project. I'll mention one, a story that uh, I actually mentioned when we were recording a podcast earlier, just something really weird and wacky that I found in the archives. So I was uh, living in Moscow on a Fulbright. I'd actually finished the core research I wanted to do. The, the Russian archivist said, you know what, we don't actually want you to see any more documents on this particular topic. They were getting a little concerned, I think, about the project. So I started looking for new things in the archives. Well, I had these massive Soviet-era finding aids. They just give you a vague description of what's in these boxes, and then you try to request them. And if they think it's not sensitive, they might let you see them. Well, one of them was labeled death ray. And I thought, oh, that sounds interesting. Uh, can I take a look? And they said, sure, yeah. So I got this big stack of files from 1934. And there was a really interesting story in there. And I've, I've written a, an academic article on this. Uh, but um, I don't think the story is very well known. So inventor Nikola Tesla uh, had retired to New York uh, in the 30s, basically broke Westinghouse, the company he'd worked for, had essentially left him penniless, had treated him terribly. He was still working on all sorts of new ideas, but he was also becoming increasingly senile in his old age, and his health was not great. But apparently, at some cocktail party that he was invited to, he met a Soviet diplomat from the Soviet consulate in New York. And offhandedly, and possibly after a great deal of drinking, Tesla remarked that he was working on a thing he called the, a peace ray. Well, this young Soviet uh, officer, who was not a diplomat, he was in fact an intelligence officer, uh, asked him, OK, can you tell me a little more? Well, it turned out Nikola Tesla had been sketching out what he what was effectively a death ray. It was an incineration beam that would cause matter to break apart. Essentially, he, he thought he could break the, the molecular bonds by building this crazy device. Well, uh, the US military had said, no, no thank you, You're, you no, we're not interested. The British had turned him down, but he, he asked his Soviet buddy, uh, hey, would, would the Soviet government be interested? And they said yes. They offered him $25,000, which was a lot of money at that time, in exchange for the delivery of uh, the prototype design. From what I can tell, they tried to build it in Kazakhstan, in the desert. Uh, didn't work, it turns out. And part of the story that was so interesting to me is that a lot of these records are from essentially the NKVD officer, this intelligence officer, later KGB, uh, back to Moscow. And his, his job is to stay with Tesla, make sure he's working on this, make sure that the Soviet government's getting their money. And his reports are in increasingly kind of desperate. Like, I don't think Nikola Tesla's got his, his mind right. And one of the last one reads that he walked with Nikola Tesla through Central Park, and Tesla sat down on a bench and was uh, feeding pigeons. And one of them came up, and Tesla was stroking it, and he informed his uh, Soviet counterpart that this, was, this pigeon was the reincarnation of his dead girlfriend from Yugoslavia, uh, who came to visit him every day when he went to feed the pigeons in Central Park. And the Soviet intelligence officer kind of did a dot, dot, dot at the end of the report, like, I hope that death ray prototype is working. I'm not, I'm not so confident. But anyway, kind of a fascinating story about uh, Soviet interest in technology and uh, what ended up being the last big project of Tesla's life. Thank you so much, Professor Johnson. Please join me in giving him a very warm round of applause.